Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. Nausea and vomiting has been broken up into three main categories when associated with chemotherapy. Acute nausea and vomiting is the nausea and vomiting that occurs within 24 hours after a chemotherapy drug is given. Delayed nausea and vomiting lasts from day one on out to day five. And then there's something called anticipatory nausea and vomiting, which is what you get when you get another dose of chemotherapy. You can get nausea and vomiting because you associate it with the previous dose of chemotherapy. Or also sometimes even driving by the hospital or seeing the chemotherapy nurse in the drugstore will cause nausea and vomiting for some patients. It's the old Pavlov's dog ringing of the bell uh, that they associated with uh, eating and sal salivating. These people associate seeing the nurse or the hospital with nausea and vomiting associated with the chemotherapy. Back 30 years ago when I started as a medical oncologist and we were treating people with cisplatin-based chemotherapy, we would treat them with what we called ABVD, which is Ativan, Benadryl, Compazine, and Dexamethasone. And basically we'd give them enough Ativan to where they would sleep off their nausea and vomiting so they didn't have as much problem with it then. Uh, things have changed quite a bit since that time. Different chemotherapy drugs have been attributed to causing different amounts of nausea and vomiting. There are, people, there are chemotherapy drugs that are highly metagenic, which mean they will cause nausea or vomiting, actually vomiting, in greater than 90% of patients if you did not give them any antiemetics. Moderately metagenic drugs cause vomiting in 30 to 90% of patients. Minimally metagenic agents cause it in 10 to 30% of patients. There are some drugs that hardly cause any nausea or vomiting at all, less than 10%. Uh, in addition to different drugs causing different amounts of nausea and vomiting, there are different patient characteristics that are associated with more nausea and vomiting. Women tend to have more nausea and vomiting than do men. Younger people have more nausea and vomiting than do older people. If patients have had morning sickness from pregnancy or motion sickness, they tend to have more trouble with nausea and vomiting. My own bias is that patients who get nausea and vomiting associated with anesthesia will get more nausea and vomiting with chemotherapy. And I think of all those things as different types of poisons, if you will, and the body reacts to them by causing vomiting to get people to get rid of those poisons. And chemotherapy is a toxic type of medication. That's probably why the body tries to get rid of the uh, agents by causing nausea and vomiting. CINV treatment has been an overwhelming success uh, over the years. It's actually been one of the major success stories in oncology. Unfortunately, there are so, still some areas that we need to improve upon. When we look at the incidence of the CINV, particularly from the emesis standpoint, um, there's been dramatically reduced, almost to the point where less than one out of every 10 patients prior to highly metagenic chemotherapy uh, have emesis. Unfortunately, from a nausea standpoint, which is the other half of CINV, uh, there are still major rooms, uh, major areas of improvement that are needed. Uh, still patients in 30 to 40 percent of the time, depending upon the studies that you read, still will have significant nausea, particularly in the delayed phase. The impact of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting is very dramatic from a patient standpoint. It can dramatically affect their quality of life, their ability to perform daily activities of living, as well as just their general, general overall well, uh, feeling of general well-being. It's also very important from a treatment standpoint. We've had patients in the past that have such horrific nausea and vomiting that they have refused subsequent therapy, potentially life-saving chemotherapy.